When we pontificate on the mechanical prowess of a motorcycle, it usually starts with the engine. And that makes sense, right? Those big jugs, that engorged stroke, the massive amounts of torque and top-end horsepower that puts the fear of God into your heart. As we work our way through an overview, appreciating a motorcycle's components like the sensual curves of a fine woman, we ultimately find ourselves at the suspension, the geometry of a swing arm, the adjustability of a fork, but it usually stops there. Because, well, a telescopic fork is a telescopic fork, right? It's the ubiquitous fixture of nearly every motorcycle's front end, except for Janus. Despite the fact that the highly intelligent engineers concluded decades ago that the telescopic fork is kind of the gold standard for performance cost and ease of production, there's actually been lots of different attempts to reinvent the motorcycle front end, ultimately with mixed results. So today, let's dive into some wild motorcycle front end experiments. Let's get into it. We should probably start off strong with the hub center steering system. With this front end design, your front wheel is not held in place by a fork, but instead with an additional swing arm, sort of like a car. The steering happens inside the hub itself, which results in a motorcycle handling a little bit like black magic. One of the finest examples of hub center steering is the Bimota Tezi. Tezi translates to thesis, which is a fun little nod to the fact that Bimota was experimenting with this machine. The prototype was unveiled first in 1983, but it didn't go fully into production, using that term a little loosely because Bimota is far from what you'd consider as a mass production manufacturer until 1990. Since Bimota has always sourced engines from other companies, they were able to pool all the resources into bespoke chassis designs. And the telescopic fork found on most bikes combines steering and suspension, meaning that any movement affects the other. Steering inputs are transmitted directly through the fork tubes, which also compress under braking, causing dive. Hub center steering, like that found on the Tezi, actually separates the two functions, eliminating their negative interactions. That sounds pretty good. The front wheel is mounted via a swing arm and the steering happens through linkages inside of the wheel hub, and suspension is handled by a shock, like you would find on the rear of the bike. Yamaha actually tried their hand at the same system with the GTS 1000 in the 90s. This was by all means a super modern sport tour. It had ABS, fuel injection, and a bespoke front end. But as we've learned many times over, oftentimes a motorcycle that is too modern, too advanced, and a little too crazy takes away from what makes a motorcycle fun to ride. Hub center steering is, in theory, better, right? There's no brake dive, less geometry changes mid-corner, which results in a very planted and stable front end. But riding a motorcycle is about feedback. When riding spiritedly, you have to listen to your bike and give it what it needs. It's truly a symbiotic relationship, but hub center steering removes that rider feedback entirely. It makes your bike feel numb and disconnected to the rider compared to the direct feel of a telescopic fork. You lose that intuitive sense of what the front tire is doing, which can make it harder to read. And also, it's just that really fun feeling of loading up the front tire, feeling the suspension collapse, and understanding what the bike is doing. It kind of takes away what makes riding a bike feel like riding a bike, if that makes sense. Instead, the GTS 1000 felt like you were driving a car or playing a video game or something. So, because of the cost attributed and the disconcerting feeling that many riders experienced, hub center steering just never really caught on. Honda's ELF project was another example of a wild experimentation that actually predated the Tezi or the GTS 1000. In the late 70s, French oil company ELF decided to slap its logo on something faster than a European econo box. So, it started bankrolling a series of prototype race builds. And instead of just building another motorcycle, ELF gave its engineers pretty much a blank check to just reinvent the chassis entirely. The result was a whole string of bikes, each crazier than the last. The ELF racers ditched telescopic forks entirely and went all in on single-sided swing arms at both ends of the bike. That's almost an oxymoron. If it's a single-sided swing arm, how can it be on both 
ends. You know, if it's a single side, anyways. A single-sided swing arm on the front and the back is what I mean. I mean, yeah, it's like one arm here, one arm there. You get what I'm saying. The front and rear wheels were each held up by a single swing arm with a shock absorber. Suspension and steering forces were totally separated, just like with hub center steering, which gave the bikes nearly zero brake dive and super stable geometry mid-corner. And on paper, they were decades ahead of their time. Their most famous versions were the Elf 2, 3, and 4, ridden by legends like Ron Haslam in endurance races and even in GP competition. And these bikes actually worked. They won races, proved competitive against conventional machines, and showed that radical geometry wasn't just a pipe dream. So, why do we all ride bikes with telescopic forks then? Well, like most experiments, reality kicked in. They were complicated, expensive to maintain, and hard to fine tune. Riders also complained that they just felt different, more stable, yes, but lacking that all-important feedback of traditional forks. And that was a common fault of the hub center steering design. By the late 1980s, Honda absorbed what it learned from ELF, shelved the freak show chassis, and applied the knowledge to more conventional motorcycles. DJI has partnered with us to bring the new Osmo 360 into the Yami New production lineup, and I have to say, it's been a game changer. Setup is basically instant, and the footage looks incredible. You're getting 8K resolution, outstanding clarity even in low light, and all of it comes from the industry's first 1-inch 360-degree imaging square sensor. For riders, it's a perfect tool. Whether you want a clean helmet mount for motovlogging or a discreet, lightweight setup on the bike itself, the Osmo 360 delivers a wide dynamic view without being a hassle to carry. And the best part is how smoothly it integrates into DJI's whole ecosystem. I've been running the mic mini with it and the audio has been flawless. No spaghetti of wires or weird connections to worry about. Between the 8K capture, 100 minute recording time, internal memory, and easy mounting options, this really is the full package for anyone looking to step into 360 filming. Hit the link in the description to grab yours and pick up a DJI Osmo 360 today. If hub center steering is like the futurist experiment that was propositioned to supplant telescopic forks, what were bikes running before them? If you ever need a reason to remind yourself that the telescopic forks stay goaded, just look at what bikes used to use. Girder forks. A girder fork is basically a triangular framework of metal struts that kind of look like a combination of a bicycle fork and some mid-century modern table legs. The wheel's axle is mounted at the bottom of the structure, which pivots near the top of the steering head. What little suspension there was is handled by a spring mounted between the girder arms and the motorcycle's frame. Now, this system was commonly found on motorcycles made in the first half of the 20th century. Girder forks are sort of like a rotary phone or a typewriter. They work, I guess, but it would be nearly impossible to use either one of those to slide into your mom's DMs. A subsect of the girder style are Springer forks. You'd probably recognize these as what's still used on chopper style motorcycle builds today because chopper guys are masochists. Springer forks feature two parallel sets of legs with a rigid rear leg connected to the triple tree and a shorter front leg that actuates the springs. Just springs, no tubes, no fork oil, just nude springs exposed to the elements. Modern mattresses don't even use springs anymore. <laughs> springs alone aren't enough to control the sheer mass of a modern human in the bedroom or on uneven road surfaces. These archaic designs are heavier, harsher, and offer less control. Are you gonna race a Model T around Mugello? Didn't think so. All right, BMW owners, just shut off the video now. You're not gonna like what I have to say. BMW owners will try to explain the merits of a two-cylinder boxer engine, and they would be wrong. Bold-faced liars, even. But if they were to discuss the value of BMW's proprietary suspension experiments, they would be less wrong. Still a little wrong. They are BMW owners, after all, but less wrong. Since the Germans love to over-engineer everything and even engineer out problems that they could just as easily just not have in the first place, we have the telelever suspension. 
Instead of a normal fork, a bike equipped with the telelever suspension system essentially has a big ass wishbone and a shock attached to the frame. The fork tubes are basically just there to steer, not to manage the weight. So as a result, you get almost no brake dive. BMW guys consider this a cheat code. If you grab a handful of front brake on a 1300 GS, the bike remains very calm with no drama, just like you'd expect from a cold, soulless German. Like I said, some people love it and they'll defend it endlessly, but some people enjoy the feedback they get from a motorcycle. And just a little secret, BMW didn't actually invent this type of suspension. It was actually adopted in the 90s from the pivoted wishbone design that came from the British company Saxon Motad. The telelever isn't the only front end design that was adopted by BMW. They were also inspired by a patent from Scotsman Norman Hassock. If the telelever was so good, what could be better? Two levers, and the duo lever suspension was born. It was essentially race car suspension applied to a motorcycle. Just as a quick side note, anytime car people have tried to get involved with motorcycles, it's almost always gone wrong. You have F1 guys coming over to MotoGP that can never make the things work. Bikes are not cars, cars are not bikes. Leave us alone in the two-wheeled world, the freaking car people, get out of here, man. So it was two wishbones, one shock, and a steering system completely separate from braking forces. They put this on their big K-series tourers where it is still found on the K1600 today. If there is any motorcycle that needs a little help in the suspension department, it is one that weighs nearly 1,000 pounds. As further proof, Honda also uses a similar system on the Goldwing. And with that much mass, you're gonna need a little something extra under the hood to keep everything right side up during hard braking. A more unique example of this Hassock style dual wishbone suspension is the one found on the Britain V1000. I love this bike, it's really cool. Listen up. This bike was hand built by New Zealander John Britton in the 1990s. This bike was novel in countless ways, most notably being its frameless design. Motorcycle journalist Alan Cathcart wrote, it's incredibly ironic that instead of Europe or Japan, the most sophisticated and technically advanced motorcycle in the world comes from New Zealand. The V1000 actually ended up winning the Battle of the Twins at the Daytona International Speedway, proving that there must be some merit to the dual wishbone front end. I guess it's not just BMW people simping after all. Now, I've had a lot of hands-on experience with the leading link forks. I never thought I would say that, but I recently took on the responsibility of extensively testing a Janus Halcyon 250. And that motorcycle employs a leading link front fork. Once you swing a leg over that bike, the front suspension is one of the first elements you notice. A leading link front fork has two rigid fork legs connected at the top of the steering head. And instead of the axle being at the end of the legs, it's mounted to a short swing arm that pivots in front of them. Also connected to the swing arm are two shocks so that when the wheel hits a bump, the swing arm pivots upwards and compresses the shock. A unique feature of this style of fork is that when you engage the front brake, it prevents the front end from compressing. Now, this was mostly popular in the world of sidecar rigs, where front end stability and consistency was more important than precise handling or rider feedback. BMW used a similar Earl's fork design in the 1950s as a precursor to their future telelever experiments. Earl's recognized that the main problem with the leading link design is that as the links are independent, if the springs are slightly mismatched, the front wheel will twist during suspension travel. Hmm, twist, front end, could, could that result in a serious front end wobble? Maybe, how curious. Earl's solution was to make a rigid swing arm to hold the front wheel. In order to make it rigid, it had to be pivoted behind the wheel. As we made clear in our Janus series, this is a unique design that is different from the leading link design used on the Halcyon 250. And you're correct, I will not be silenced about this Janus situation and I have to keep bringing it up seemingly every other video. 
So, what's the verdict? For over 100 years, people have tried to reinvent the motorcycle front end. You got girders, springers, hub centers, telelevers, duo levers. Some of them worked great, some of them were too good, and some of them were over-engineered nightmares that proved not to be worth the hassle. But at the end of the day, the simple telescopic fork keeps winning. Not because it's an entirely perfect design, but because it's good enough 99.99% .99 of the time. They're light, cheap to produce, and can work in basically everything from a Ninja 250 to a Panigale V4R. That's pretty cool when you think about it. Will Telelever ever become the standard? Well, until everyone wants to pay $30,000 for a motorcycle, probably not. But if you're Bavarian pilled enough, you can march down to the BMW dealership and try one out for yourself. I hear they are great about test drives. I hear they also have free hot pretzels in the waiting room of that service department as well. I hear every BMW owner gets access to the free centralized Motorrad healthcare plan. I didn't know about that. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the video, everybody. I will see you all in the next one. Fact, competitive art, including painting and sculpture, was once an Olympic sport. It makes you wonder how they judged that, huh? Was it speed, precision, beauty? I don't know, knowing the Greeks, they probably just ended up screwing all the men anyways. So, goodbye.